Welcome back to The In Chamber. I'm your host, Tom Schumann. The Indiana Chamber has been measuring Indiana's competitiveness against other states on a variety of measures for more than two decades. First in the Indi Economic Vision 2010 initiative, and now in the current Indiana Vision 2025 plan. In the dynamic and creative culture driver of that plan, one of the goals is to increase Indiana's exports to achieve a top five ranking among all states. Well, there's some good news and, and maybe some bad news there. Indiana's export rankings have actually been among the most consistent of all the metrics over that time, typically in or near the top 10, measured both on a per capita basis and by exports as a percentage of gross domestic product. Improvement, however, has been difficult to come by, and some of Indiana's success might be attributed to its industry mix and having major players in certain heavy export goods. Uh, think motor vehicle transmission, other automobile parts, and certain medications. But exporting is something that can be viable for businesses of all sizes. It can be the difference between simply surviving and truly thriving. We're going to talk exports today with a focus on an independent federal agency that can assist with this, especially on the financing side. Mark Klein, Regional Director for the Export Import Bank of the United States. Welcome to the In Chamber. Thanks. Happy to be here. Well, Mark, you're coming to us today from uh, from Louisville, Kentucky, I believe. And, and as, uh, as I said in the intro, you work for the Export Import Bank. But you've got a lot of experience in Indiana. Give the listeners a little sense. I know uh, you've worked with certain industries and, and certain communities and, and also familiarity with central Indiana. Sure. So in my role of, of at regional director of Exxon Bank, where I've been for 11 years, uh, I've always covered southern Indiana, which is basically anything south of Indianapolis. So that's kind of been my job with Exxon. Before that, when I wore my my banker hat for a couple different commercial banks. Uh, Southern Indiana was my territory. So very familiar with the some of the veneer and the wood companies in Southern Indiana, right across the river from me in New Albany, Jeffersonville, uh, Clarksville, uh, cover Indian, uh, Evansville. I've made my way up river a little bit uh, in my banking days, uh, spent a lot of time in Madison, Indiana. Um, so that was going back to when I first started international banking in 2000. So that goes, gives us to about 21 years of me wandering around Indiana and, and visiting with some of the different exporters there. And I know you mentioned certainly being in central Indiana quite a bit also. Uh, of course, you told me one of your favorite places to eat here. You might have a little difficult time getting in this week with the... Uh, <clears throat> As we have this conversation in the middle of March Madness, the uh, wait times are pretty long at St. Elmo's this week. You're not going to get into St. Elmo's, and I imagine my, my other favorite place for lunch is Shapiro's Delicatessen, and I bet you couldn't find a place to sit in Shapiro's right now. Uh, yeah, you know, we're, we're on the same wavelength there, my, my wife and I, that is certainly one of our favorite places, and, and we've taken advantage even during the past year with, with lots of carryout from Shapiro's. Uh, Mark, let's start with some of the basics uh, before we get into the Export Import Bank and, and, and what it can do. Make the case a little bit for companies that, that, that should or could take a look at exporting. Why is it so important? Well, it's, it's you know, and I'm not going to regurgitate the, the data that we always see. Uh, you know, it is 95% of the world's buying power is outside the United States. We've all seen that. That's that's kind of the standard lead line of why anybody should be exporting. Um, you know, why I think companies should be exporting is exactly what we're going through right now, what we went through in 2011, 2012, 2013. If you're relying solely on domestic sales and there's a hiccup, whether that's the COVID crisis or the financial crisis that we had, you know, in, in you know, 2010 for the for three years following that, if you're relying just on domestic business, there's a chance that uh, your doors are going to close. And I have talked to a variety of companies uh, over the years that have told me in response to the financial crisis uh, earlier this decade, if it wasn't for international, I wouldn't still be open. It's just the idea. It's, it's all about diversifying your, your customer portfolio. So instead of just focusing everything on domestic, you know, 95% of the, of the world aside, 
you, it's just a matter of, of, of diversity. Well, when you mentioned hiccups, those are two major, major hiccups of the of the past twelve years or yeah, so. Yeah, I'd probably call them more of a of a full fledged barf other than a hiccup. Yeah, but, uh, expand beyond the hiccup level, yeah, for sure. But uh, Mark, when it comes to size of businesses, and and again, I, maybe it's a perception thing that they're probably more larger companies, maybe they have more resources to be able to, to do the exporting and to establish those international relationships. But what about small businesses? What what guidance, what do you say in response to maybe the, those small business leaders that say they're too busy putting out the fires each day to, to take a good look at exporting? You know, I can appreciate the fact that that, uh, you know, just sometimes keeping your head above water um, is the most important thing. But there are so many for small businesses and medium sized and large businesses, too. But for small businesses, there are so many resources out there. One of my favorite sayings is, you know, when you start looking at exporting, don't make it difficult. It's going to be different if you go in with the mindset knowing that you're going to have to learn different things, you're going to have to access different tools, you're going to have a different board of directors, if you will, for your export portfolio than you do your domestic portfolio. If you know that things are going to be a little bit different, it makes it a lot easier. And I work with a number of companies to where it's a husband and wife. I can't tell you the number of companies that I work with that are literally husband and wife and they're selling packaged foods, they're selling chemicals, they're selling hair care products, the list goes on and on um, to where it's, it's, there's ways that we can, you know, myself, the U.S. Commercial Service, the Small Business Administration, Small Business Development Centers, there's a lot of people out there that really do, and I know the whole thing is we're from the government, we're here to help. There, there really are a lot of folks from the government, we really are here to help, and we're happy to do so. <laughs> Mark, let's talk a little bit about markets and industries. Uh, you know, first, say de dest destinations. Uh, nearly half of Indiana's exports go to our North American neighbors, Canada and Mexico. Uh, talk a little bit about that. And, and what are some of the other uh, popular countries, areas around the world where, where we're seeing Indiana exports uh, go to? Well, you've got, you know, and that, and that goes for a, a lot of the states here in, in the United States, you know, Canada and Mexico, primary markets, uh, we can thank NAFTA, um, now the, the US, Mexico, Canada, free trade agreement, we, you know, that makes that a lot easier. Um, where I see a lot of product coming from, you know, from Indiana, and this is, you already keyed in on it, that it's, it's transportation equipment, transportation materials is the number one you know, export. Um, there's a good portion of agricultural uh, exports that, that leave Indiana. Um, you know, and those goes to all parts of the world. That goes to Africa, that goes to the Middle East, that goes to Asia, uh, Latin America. That's a strong market for a lot of the exports from Indiana. So there, I'm not going to say that there's, there's one market outside of Canada and Mexico that jumps out um, for the simple fact that, that what Indiana has the rest of the world really wants it. Um, so there, there's a good chance that, that Indiana companies, that they're doing business in Africa, you know, Western Europe, Eastern Europe, Latin America, Japan, Australia, New Zealand. Um, and I know they're doing that because I've worked with a lot of companies that are exploring exports into those markets. So Mark, people are probably not as familiar maybe with the Export Import Bank. Uh, give us the overview a little bit. You said you've been with the organization 11 years. Talk about what you what you do and, and ways that you can assist uh, companies looking at looking at exporting. Sure. We, we always jokingly say that, that X and Bank were one of the best kept government secrets out there. <laughs> um, and, and we we acknowledge that a lot of the companies that that I when I when I make presentations and uh, that's a pro that's a priority job for me is is actually going out and spreading the word because we don't like being the best kept government secret out there. Uh, so I, I always say I shake a lot of hands, kiss a lot of babies, uh, make a lot of speeches. But when I visit with with when I make presentations, visit with companies, I go in knowing that a majority of the folks they don't know who we are. Um, we are the official export credit agency of the United States. Export credit agency being abbreviated as ECA. That shows up globally all the time. I, I like to say that ECA financing 
is what makes the world go round. So we're the official export credit agency for the United States. There's about 100 ECAs around the world. Most of your developing countries have a version of Exim Bank. Your developing companies, the, the, they're, they have Exim Banks. And the whole job of an ECA, the role of an ECA, is to supplement the financing that's already out there, the private sector financing that's already available. We're not trying to replicate it. We're not trying to replace it. We're supplementing it. So as a, in a true government agency, when, when all else fails, we're the Band-Aid. We come in and we provide a, a solution to the access to capital. That's primarily what we focus on is, is it access to capital for the US company that needs to export goods or is it access to capital for the foreign buyers that want to buy US goods? And why do we do this? It's been in our charter since 1934 when we were founded. It's to support jobs, either new jobs or sustain existing jobs through exports. So I am, I'm all about jobs. That's why we do what we do. And the idea with this access to capital, this ECA financing, it's to level the playing field with those 100 plus other ECAs out there that are doing the exact same thing that we do. Mark, that's a great explanation. I, I guess I, I would call it part of your, maybe your XM 101 speech, but it, it, that really makes it clear. And I'm sure that as you're talking to people, they start to understand then the difference between what XM does and what other government resources are available, whether it's the Small Business Administration or Department of Commerce. So uh, I assume you find that to be the case that, that you know, your efforts help complement what those other agencies are doing. Most of the time when I'm making those speeches and shaking hands and kissing babies, I'm usually doing it alongside one of my, my U.S. commercial service folks, uh, you know, based there in, in Indianapolis. Uh, you got Mark Cooper, uh, fantastic guy. And then we've got, uh, we've got a variety of the SBA folks that we usually share the stage with. Yeah, no, uh, Mark, Mark is a longtime friend and ally of the chamber, as you mentioned, does great work here in Indiana in, the, in that space. So let's get into some of the specific programs. You talked about the financing. Uh, credit, credit insurance uh, is one of those offerings. How, how does that work and under what type of scenario would that typically come into play? Yeah, so, so export credit insurance, that's the part of that access to capital. And, and that access to capital and export credit insurance is, is basically a short-term financing solution for the buyers. And what that basically export credit insurance is, it's foreign accounts receivable insurance. So it gives the, the US supplier the ability to treat a foreign buyer in the same way they would maybe a domestic company. If you're in Indiana and you're selling to someone in Michigan, you're selling to someone in Ohio, for the most part, you're going to give them some short credit terms. You know, maybe the balances due 15 days from date of receipt, 30 days from date of receipt. Most companies in the U.S. and their banks really don't like offering open account terms to foreign buyers. It's something that that uh, you know raises the hairs on the on the backs of everyone's neck when they start thinking about that. So what we do is we come in with export credit insurance that in a nutshell tells the US supplier, it's okay to export on open account terms. I know it's scary at first, but what we're gonna do then as a government agency, we're gonna come in, we're gonna perform due diligence on that buyer, we're gonna make sure they're credit worthy, and we're gonna put an insurance policy in place that basically says, Mr. Exporter, if for whatever reason they don't pay you, you're gonna file a claim with Exim Bank and you've in effect transferred a majority of your repayment risk over to the US government. You've turned that foreign account receivable now into a domestic US government receivable. The idea there is you're not gonna wake up at 2.30 in the morning in a cold sweat. And it's also gonna make your banker really, really happy knowing that, that you've taken care of business and you've insured that foreign AR that's on your books. So, so in other words, this uh, this insurance operates like just about like any other insurance, and maybe most importantly, delivers peace of mind. Is that a fair assessment? It's it's peace of mind for the U.S. supplier, but more importantly, it opens up that supplier financing capability, that access to capital for the foreign buyers. That that short term 
capital is not easily obtained outside of the US. So what it does is it allows a US company to provide that foreign buyer a short-term supplier financing solution as opposed to cash up front or go to your bank and get a, a commercial letter of credit to basically cover this transaction. It, it allows for a, a much friendlier relationship, if you will. So Mark, another aspect of kind of the, the XM portfolio that I, that I read about, and, and to be honest, I misunderstood when I, when I first took a look at it, guaranteed loans for buyers of US goods. Uh, explain that, uh, as I said, I, I, I was off base in what I thought, how it worked. You're, you're the man who's doing this every day. Give an example of that or two of how that works and how that plays into the- Sure, the so it's, it's foreign buyer financing, what it's typically known as. And this is something, it, it's think capital equipment. So think, you know, cranes, trains, planes, um, you know, at least half a million and up, 500,000 and up is kind of the real sweet spot for this. But what happens is your foreign buyer, there again, access to capital, foreign buyer is going to indicate to you that, you know, maybe the, the conversation will start that uh, you, you talk about export credit insurance and, and how I can give you 60, 90 days. And their response is, is no, I, I need a longer term financing solution. I don't have financing secured with my bank. I need you to provide three, four, five years financing which in most part, most exporters are gonna say, I don't think so, I'm not a bank, I don't do that. Um, good thing is, is we do. So what we do is, is we work with a network of banks and non-banks. Exim Bank typically is never the lender of record. We live in the world of guarantees and insurance. So what we work with is, is a lender that does provide that three, four, five, seven, if it's a big deal, up to 18 year financing, to that buyer, I guarantee that loan 100% principal and interest. So once you start throwing around 100% federal government guaranteed loans, amazing things happen. Number one, that term opens up. Instead of a company having to make a payback in two years, it goes to seven years. Instead of the interest rate in Brazil being 14.5%, I can arrange financing at 6%. It frees up the uh, the supplier's capital a little bit because they're going to get paid at the time of export. They're going to collect a down payment as part of the financing structure, but then when they deliver, when they can show that they have performed on the contract, they're going to submit documentation to that bank that is providing the financing. They're going to get paid in full. So it, it's a it's a quick repayment cycle for the for the seller, and then what's left is a government guaranteed loan at a really nice term, a really nice interest rate from a US bank to that buyer. And that is very popular Latin America, Africa, Eastern Europe, parts of Asia. When you're dealing with the in-country banks in those markets, very illiquid. They don't have the money to lend. And if they do, they're gonna charge a lot of money to do it. So if you're expecting your buyer in Brazil to manage their own financing, that might cut you out of the deal. So two two huge benefits: shorter time frames and, and better interest rates, um, amongst others advantages. Yeah, Mark, those are two key things, uh, two key programs to you know help make those connections, as you say, and, and, and help help these important deals happen. What what other things uh, can, can Indiana and U.S. exporters? Uh, how can they benefit from working with XM? Well, I've, I've covered so between the export credit insurance, our short term access to capital solution and the foreign buyer financing longer term um, access to capital financing. Those are what we call post export. Those are what can we do for your buyer so they buy your stuff or services. We have a pre-export solution. That's how we work with US suppliers and we work with their bank and we enable their bank to provide a working capital line of credit so they can grow their exports. And I come in and I tell the bank here in the US that may be a little bit nervous. US banks, and there again, this is a recovering banker saying this, US banks don't always like the word export. Kind of scares them a little bit. 
So the fact that you're a U.S. supplier and you're looking to borrow more money for them, specifically to grow your exports, you may not get the, the warmest of receptions. So we come in with a 90% principal and interest guarantee to hopefully put a smile on that banker's face. If they know that they're going to provide that line of credit to the U.S. supplier with a 90% government guarantee, hopefully it's going to open up things a little bit. They're going to, they're going to look at it ways that they can collateralize that. We have a very aggressive collateralization schedule. Um, it's just going to, it's going to give them the ability to provide that that needed export working capital to the supplier. I've got a version of that. The SBA has a version of that. I play very nicely with my SBA friends in the same sandbox. We work a lot of times with the exact with the same exporter and their lender. And between the two of us, we determine is it going to be an XM fit or is it going to be an SBA fit? And that's that's you know that right there, you know, that covers our three core products: pre-export working capital and then the post-export insurance and foreign buyer financing. Well, Mark, as you said, from your experience in the banking industry and certainly working with in Indiana and the Midwest for so many years, I think it's fair to say we have a conservative uh, approach here many, many times, including financially. It certainly helped Indiana in that financial uh, hiccup bubble of, of 2008, 2009. But uh, XM seems to be that, as you say, that that piece that helps uh, make those bankers feel a little bit better about these exporting deals. That's right. And it's, you know, not only with with the pre-export working capital guarantee, but that exporting, that export credit insurance. It takes in the banker's mind a dead asset. Banks do not like to hear about foreign accounts receivable, and they're never going to include those is a real live asset that they can lend against. But once I insure them, all of a sudden that opens the world. That's when the, the, the rainbows and the unicorns start appearing because now we have taken that foreign account receivable, which is typically a no-no. It's now something that a banker can include in their collateral base and they can lend against it. Excellent. Uh, Mark, we can't have a conversation, you know, here in, in late March of 2021 without talking about the past year. We've had uh, so many anniversaries in recent days, of whether it was shutdowns or, uh, you know, initial COVID uh, complications. But what's how has the past year affected exports and affected the work that you do? Well, I mean, I, I'd be perfectly fine if we just pretended the last year didn't take place. But uh, <laughs> I wish I wish we could you know, do that. Wishes. Um, no, it's 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 affected everything. I mean, obviously, it's affected exports. Um, you know, some markets more than others. Um, you know, our aircraft. You know, let, let's face it, planes were not flying. So what we did to support aircraft financing that was down because if you're not flying planes you're certainly not going to be looking at buying new ones um so that was down a little bit some you know i was very busy the whole time although i knew that exports as the big number was down my phone was ringing off the hook more so than ever because you got to remember as, as exxon bank we we fix risk so when the perception of risk gets higher I get really, really, really busy. So during I was going to say that I can see where that phone was ringing off the hook. <laughs> yeah. So during, you know, during a crisis like the COVID crisis or financial crisis, we've, we've been busier than ever. Um, we, we're counter cyclical when things are doing just fine on their own. 2016, 2017, 2018, I'm still busy, but I'm not scrambling, you know, like a chicken with his head cut off, trying to keep up with things. Uh, but yeah, during the COVID crisis, it's, it was, you know, the companies that, that, you know, maybe they had, maybe they were self-insuring their foreign accounts receivable. They, they were, they were exporting on open account terms, but they were, they were keeping, they were self-insuring it. They were keeping that risk internally. Well, they got nervous. So insurance came into play. Um, liquidity, that's when, you know, foreign buyer financing really picked up a little bit because, we were already seeing pre-COVID, the markets were contracting a little bit. I, we could already see that things were tightening up a little bit. Well, you know, COVID not only 
you know, tighten it up and just flat out put a padlock on things. So, uh, you know, there was a lot more demand for that supplier financing. Working capital guarantee on this side, banks were, you know, the beautiful thing, I don't know, the beautiful thing about this COVID thing, I don't think that's probably first time you ever heard that. Um, unlike the financial crisis in 2011, 2012, you know, this this wasn't a, a banking sector crisis to where the banks, you know, had to just hit the pause button on lending and everything. This was more of, of the banks were looking a little bit more, they're a little more critical in some markets, you know, some industries, they were coming to us looking for that guarantee in some cases, maybe a little bit more than what they were in the past. Um, but yeah, so we've been busy. Exports have been down, big picture. But uh, as, as risk goes up, um, any, any government agency that takes risk off the table, that's where, that's where we keep ourselves pretty busy. Well, let's look ahead to the next to next nine months or so. The rest of 2021, we're seeing many positive factors around the pandemic. Where we're, I guess we could say we're on starting on that road to recovery. So, do we see exports going up and you being busy, but not maybe as crazy busy as the the past year? You know, I think I, if I had my crystal ball, and I don't need a crystal ball to tell you that exports are going to go up. There is, I think, there is so much pent up demand in the market right now because you got to remember this wasn't a this wasn't a financial crisis this was something that just we woke up one day and everything was fine and the next day everything was shut down so it what you know this was so there is a lot of pent up demand it's it's you know it's basically it's like once they start opening up the restaurants and the bars those restaurants and bars it's going to be tough to get a reservation in anywhere they're going to be extremely busy. So I think exports are going to be busy. I'm going to continue to be busy. Um, I don't think things are going to get, even when the, when the world opens up again and exports start growing again, I, I think everybody, you know, everybody's going to have a, uh, we're going to have COVID in the rear view mirror for a while. And I, I think everybody is still going to be thinking, what can I do to mitigate risk. Yes, I love the fact that I, my that I'm getting the orders pouring in again. Exports are good, but I'm thinking they're going they're going to, you know, risk is going to be first and foremost still for a while. And then diversification is probably going to become top of mind for many companies and, and leaders who who hadn't maybe given a, enough thought to that important right. topic. Yeah. Right. Mark you mentioned early on, you know, having to your role of having to familiar familiarize people with XM, but one of the places that, that they may have heard of certainly of the agency in the past has been the battles over Washington over reauthorization, uh, often in the news. But late 2019, uh, an historic seven-year authorization was agreed to. Uh, certainly, certainty is, is wonderful. We know businesses love certainty, but what does that certainty mean for your agency and, and the companies that you work with? Well, you know, there, we had a couple things going on over the over the past couple of years, Tom. And, and the first part was uh, we did have a, let me kind of backtrack a little bit. So Exim Bank is a sunset agency. What that basically means is we're temporary. Every four to five years, Congress has to go through what's called an authorization, reauthorization process. They have to get, they have to vote both houses. They have to vote and give us the right to keep doing business. Um, we've been temporary since 1934, but we are still a temporary agency. Um, so this reauthorization process has to be done. Uh, 2014, 2015, major hiccup. There again, I probably I would say this is a full-fledged barf again. Um, you know, we lost reauthorization. Now, did that mean that we closed? No, it just basically, because we still have a, a large portfolio to manage. What it did mean was that for, I believe it was about four and a half months, uh, we couldn't take on any new risk. So no new insurance, no new foreign buyer financing, no new nothing. Um, that was eventually fixed. We finally got it out of, of, of the House and the Senate. We got voted, which incidentally, when it does come up for a vote, majority of uh, overwhelming majority of, of both uh, the House and the Senate support what we do. But in the government world, it doesn't take too many pieces lining up the wrong way that can kind of really gum up the works a little bit. So um, in addition to us being, you know, 
not authorized and not able to take on new business for a period of time. During that time period, some of our board members' terms expired. We did not have a board quorum coming out of that reauthorization battle. That's important for us because without a board quorum, the way that our charter language used to read, without a board quorum, we cannot do any deals over 10 million. Any deals over $10 million require board approval. And if we don't have a quorum, you don't get board approval. That was not a four and a half month problem. That was a four and a half year problem. That finally, once we got uh, Chairman Kimberly Reed, once she came on board, uh, that was May of 2019, she came on board and we fixed our board quorum. She came on board and she brought along two board members. So now we have three, our typical board is five. So we have three board members, we have a quorum now. Hallelujah, we got a board quorum. Then in December of 2019, that's when we got that seven year reauthorization. The longest reauthorization we've ever had at Exxon Bank. And it does, it gives us stability until September of 2026. So it, it gives the banking world, it gives our exporters, it gives the buyers outside the US, it gives them certainty that Exxon Bank is basically going to stay off of the front page of the Wall Street Journal until September of 2026. And we're gonna hang out on the back pages. And although we don't like being the best kept government secret in the world, we really like being on the back page of the Wall Street Journal and flying under the radar. Yeah, um, so uh, back page you, instead of the front page. I you got a, that right. With, with a newspaper and journalism background, I can understand that totally. Uh, Mark, as we wrap up here, a couple of questions. We, we, so we've talked about the work you do, the important work of, of XM. Uh, how about yourself? What are some things you like to do in your spare time when, when you're not uh, on the job or out uh, you know, touting the, the services of XM? <laughs> well, if, if you would have asked me that a couple of years ago, I would have said that uh, my, my, two, my two daughters keep me extremely busy chasing them around. Uh, but now they are both, uh, I've got one that uh, graduated with her master's degree uh, a couple years ago. I'm really proud of her to where she is now the athletic trainer for the women's pro soccer team here in Louisville. So she's doing fine. My other daughter is, uh, uh, she's first year law school up at the University of Maryland. She's doing okay. Um, so I'm not chasing them around as much. Um, still Venmoing them a lot of money. Uh, on a regular basis. But so now well, in lieu of chasing my daughters around, I'm, I'm really trying to work on my golf game a little bit. Um, and it needs a whole lot of work. So, uh, but uh, you know, that and, and my wife and Joy, we, you know, both of my daughters were, were collegiate athletes. Um, so we're, we're big supporters of the Louisville Cardinals and whether it's, you know, basketball, football, field hockey, soccer, softball, uh, we keep ourselves busy down on U of L's campus, uh, watching some sports. Excellent. Uh, you know, last question, Mark. Uh, I'll throw out at you uh, again, kind of that forward-looking phase. What What are some things that uh, guidance you would give that we talked at the beginning about businesses and why they should consider exporting? But what's something you would say to the again to those business owners, those managers listening in that? Uh, you know, of what they might think about moving forward and considering exporting as a potential uh, scenario for their organization. You know, back to, there's a, it's a really, really, really big world out there. And there's a lot of customers out there. Um, keep that in mind. Also, don't be afraid to ask for help. Whether that's talk, you know, giving me a call, talking to your banker, talking to Mark Cooper at the, at the U.S. Commercial Service, you know, talking to your, you know, talk to your attorney, talk to your accountants. There's, there's, there's ways that they're going to, it doesn't have to be difficult. It's going to be different. You're going to have to learn new payment terms. You don't have to deal with letters of credit and documentary collections when you're selling domestically. You don't have to worry about wire transfers. Money just flows back and forth through an ACH process. You know, INCO terms, you know, how are you getting, you know, how are you shipping this product overseas? Are you arranging it? Is your buyer arranging it? Who's paying for it? Who's insuring that? A lot of, of different topics to be covered. 
but there's a lot of different people to help you do it. So, so my, my answer is, is I encourage, uh, you know, do a little bit of homework. There's a lot of information out there. Do a little homework and, and, and figure out, you know, which markets, you know, have a potential for you. Um, be receptive. Don't just, if you get a crazy email or a crazy phone call, don't just immediately put it in the trash bin. Most of the companies that I work with, the smaller companies, they started out as what I call accidental exporters. They had absolutely no intention of exporting a product ever until someone outside of the U.S. found their website. But an opportunity came about. And huh? that was it. They didn't delete the email. They answered the phone. They, they properly vetted it. Don't check your common sure. sense at the border. They properly vetted it. And now they're... You know, they're growing that export business because they realize it's, it's there, it's out there. Well, as you said, it's a big world, but it's one that's getting smaller all the time in, a, in another sense. So, Mark Klein, thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, we appreciate the, the, the insights and the work you do with the Export-Import Bank of the, of the U.S. I enjoyed it. This has been a lot of fun. All right. Thank you, Mark. Uh, just a couple quick notes about uh, some of our upcoming guests on the podcast. Uh and we will turn to uh, come back to Indiana. We'll go to West uh, Central Indiana, Terre Haute area. AJ Patton is a Terre Haute native who now is doing some exciting things in the Chicago area with uh, with housing and providing opportunities for for people in need. And he's looking at doing business in Indiana. We'll also have an upcoming conversation with Beth Kersey, who is new to Indiana as head of, of the Anthem operations here throughout the state. We'll get to know her and, and the work that she's doing. Uh, as always, we appreciate you listening. We encourage you to visit indianachamber.com for the latest on, on the Chamber's events and conferences that are coming up. Thank you for listening. We'll be back with our next episode in two weeks. 